today, it's all about getting bluegill for a fish fry tonight. Now, bluegill to me is one of the most underrated fish for consumption. And really, I think the only reason people shy away from it is because it's a little labor intensive to clean. So when we go bluegill fishing, it's all about efficiency, both in catching and cleaning. And we wanna share a lot of this with you today. As a little side experiment, we're gonna be trying to fish with cicada grubs as well as night crawlers and see kind of which one outperforms the other one. We'll share with you how we uh, catch them and how we clean them and just a little bit of what dinner's gonna look like tonight. Gear, we're gonna be on the kayaks today. I've shown these buckets in another video. This is the best way to haul in and store your fish so you're not dealing with a floating fish basket. It's a real pain in a kayak. We're just at the beginning of spawn, so we're almost what I'd still call pre-spawn, but there are a few beds that have formed on the nest. Nick, uh, that fishes the lake almost every day, was telling me about it today. 78 degrees. Yeah, it's pretty warm. Barometric pressure is almost balanced, perfectly even. The start about 11 o'clock today. Most of the time when a bluegill fishing, I'd really wanna go early or late. But when the lake is right and the time of year is right, time of day is a lot less important. Ready to go fishing? I am. Let's go. All right. I don't know. I feel like uh, it's going to be like a giant bee moth. But I also think these may get pecked at a lot and just might not. They might almost be too big. I don't know if you guys do this, but every time I go fishing, I always, if I got the, even a, a complete wrong lure for where you're fishing, I always throw it at least once or twice just to see what happens because you just never know, you know? Maybe I will find the new way of catching the biggest fish in the world that nobody knew existed. And yeah, that's just how I think. Like a little kid. Oh, and when you're kayak fishing, your toes become real handy, so don't wear shoes because you can just hold your pole with your toes like a monkey. Makes um, keeping your reel out of the water a little easier when you're tying your line, especially if you're using a slightly longer rod. Ooh, wow. Look at that. Nice gill, baby. Yep. That pretty First fish of the day. That? Some blue around here. Is that why it's called a bluegill? First one down. Half a worm. Single split shot on the Golden Aberdeen. When you're bluegill fishing, simple is better. Having a hook that has a long shank is really important too, though, because that's going to help you not just with getting the hook set, but it's going to help you get the hook out of the mouth quick and you move on to the next fish. Huh? My drag is not set very well. We fixed that and whoa, Aaron's on the board. Yeah. All right. Yeah. You're a handsome fella. Might be a hybrid between a bluegill and a red ear or just a really lightly colored red ear. But at least it, I got my first fish of the day. There we go. Right there. Stick it up on that ridge and pull it off towards us. Oh, these are nice. Now this is a true bluegill right here. See with a true bluegill, I can barely get my finger in its mouth and there's no red on that gill plate right there. And when you're holding a bluegill, here's the trick. These spines are super sharp and they will get you. So you put your hand over its face and you slide it back and you push these down as you grab it. That's the trick to not getting poked. This is a high wall here but you see this little weird ridge sticking out. You can assume that that probably runs underwater. 
So I'm fishing the top of this ridge, and just as I pull it off the side where it goes down into deep water, that's where I'm catching the fish. Now, that being the high wall, what that means is that at one point there was a drag line sitting on this side of the lake, had a boom that hung all the way over, and it dropped the bucket. And when the bucket dropped, it cuts a straight wall down. And then when they get to the bottom, they, they pull it. Then this bucket swings around and lays the, the, the earth on the other side, on the same side that the drag line was on. We're gonna head down the lake a few hundred feet to where the spill piles descend under the water. These ribs make an amazing fish habitat. They're these ridges and valleys, and basically you can start at the bank where the ridge and valley is completely out of the water, and that shape will descend all the way down under the water into the deepest part of the lake, which is about 50 feet in this lake. This was a big mine when this was going on. Probably in the 1920s or 30s when this was mined, so getting close to 100 year old since, it, since the mine ended. Officially it was 1977 when uh, the government passed a uh, law saying land had to be reclaimed, so, the, so mines were no longer allowed to leave land in this condition. But you know, it leaves us in, here in Indiana and other places like this, leaves us a really unique scenario because now that enough time's passed, these lakes are incredible and they're unique. And legally the mines can't leave anything like that. So that makes this type of strip pit something that for thousands of years into the future is going to be really unique to this area and areas that got coal mined like this. Um, it's probably good that mines can't do this anymore because it would have been pretty ugly for the first 40, 40 or 50 years after this happened. But after enough time, man, it's really beautiful here. Look what I got, baby. I did. Oh, he's a cute little guy, isn't he? We'll let him go. Bye. Pajam. I'm gonna get this one. I'm gonna get this one. Oh, yeah. He's a good eater. Look at the mandibles. Oh, that's what he's going to get me with, is those big mandibles. Let's try it right through his back. Oh, he lost air pressure. When you puncture them, they kind of go limp. All right. That looks pretty tasty to me. I already tell you I'm feeling disappointed about the grub and I've only cast twice but when the bluegill are hitting man you, you know two casts is a long time let's see I've had what I think is the perfect cast yet let's get the perfect cast that's pretty good Bonnie, 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 bonnie. What I like to do is I just like to, if they're really big worms, tear it in two and you put it on. That way they go a little further and you don't have this massive, massive worm hanging out on your line. You don't lose so much of it that way. Got me another bass. Here's some of that. It's a nice, nice little guy. <gasps> oh, one other trick, especially when you got all kind of calm day. If you've got a, the teeniest, tiniest breeze pushing you in one direction, cast into the wind, let it drop, and let that. 
current, let, let that little movement of the kayak do the work on the lure. For some reason, I always have more luck when the wind is what's creating my retrieve. Even when I'm throwing something like a blade bait or a crank bait, I'll do that. I always cast into the wind if I can. Oh, that was a snag, I guess. There he goes. There we go. That was a little one, I think, maybe. Oh, gosh, no. Come on, come on, come on. What the hell? It's a bass. It's a, it's a badass bass. Is that like my fourth bass? Third or fourth? Come on. Get on my line. Just get on it. There we go. Got it. Yay! Look, we got a one right there. Hello, fishy. How you doing? Stop it. And this time, I'm going to try hooking him a little different, and I'm going to try slack lining him with no weight, so no split shot through the tail, like this. Oh yeah, look how active he is now. Okay, that might do a little better, that wiggle. You know, he's girthy enough. I should still be able to cast like a pretty light line on here. This is six pound, 100% fluorocarbon. Oh yeah, that's a good cast. Oh, Let's see, we got some action right away here. Feel like it may have bit it right off the hook though. It just doesn't seem like there's anything on there now. There's really nothing to it. We just need you. We'd like to eat you. So come on now. Get in my bucket. Oh, that's a good worm. Hello, fishy. How you doing? If you like it, take my lure. I sure miss you. Mighty bored. Come and grab my hook and take it down. Short. Up ahead right here, the little ripples you see in the water, that's a, net, uh, a bed where there are about 20 or 30 red ear nests and bluegill nests. I'm gonna try tossing this little grub up in there and see, they're very territorial about their nests, especially the little things that might eat eggs. So I think I might get their attention with this. But the problem I just had just a minute ago was I had a bluegill just strip the hook and I think the hook's just a pinch small. So instead of putting a new hook on and going to all that effort, I'm actually just gonna widen this hook. This is one of the nice things about golden Aberdeens. These are so flexible. Look. I just changed the shape of this hook and made it a much wider hook. Hello, I feel like you. Come here, you. Oh, come here. You're good. Oh gosh, calm down. Oh, you're safe. Oh, look at that. Would you stop it? There we go. Now, hold still. There we go. This guy. Yeah. Oh, you have got to be shitting me. Stupid fish. Stupid, stupid fish. Okay, I'm still going with the slack line, but now I've weaved the body of the, the whole grub on here. I'm starting to lose a lot of confidence that this is going to be effective. I think I've already decided it's not going to be more effective than a, than a worm, which, which is a lot. Yeah, you know, that's a pretty lofty ambition for a, a bait. Night crawlers really are sort of the any fish will eat it benchmark. So to try to outfish a night crawler is oh hey look at this stuff. look at this look at this look at this yes we caught it on the grub <laughs> well we figured out how they like them it just needs to be weaved all the way on there it doesn't matter if the body's plump and attractive looking don't read too much into that he's kind of a little guy though. Um, I don't think I'm just letting him go. Oh boy, 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 oh boy
boxes that I've put still on. Oh, son of a bitch. Oh gosh, okay. The fish has it in his mouth right now, but he keeps putting it in and spitting it out. Yeah, he didn't keep it. I, that fish, two times he had it in his mouth all the way and then he spit it out. And then he did it again. Just that easy. I think I'm about done with the grub experiment. I'd fish with them if I didn't have anything else. But I don't see that the fish are going to prefer it. I, I don't think I'd have had a night crawler sp or get spit out of that fish's mouth here just now. And since I started fishing with the grubs, it's been the slowest bite I've had all day. So the grub's just not going to do what a, what a worm can. And that's okay, because I did catch fish on it, so in a pinch I'd use it, but it's not better. I'm just gonna sit right here and play with these guys on their nest. Here's a cast you want for this moment when you don't want to raise your arms in the air. Grab the hook like this so the point's coming out in between your fingers so you cannot get it into your fingers. Open your bail, hold the line with one hand, watch this. That's how you do it. Now you can bring it into their territory. That's what we want, right there. Yes, that big toe. Look at that big toe, yes. Look at this, look at this cow. Man, that's a beautiful fish. He's a big dude. You, sir, fought valiantly. That's a big old bruiser right there. Look at that dude. Look at that beautiful color. All right, same drill. My worm's a little more torn up now, but it'll be all right. See, so I want to get just past these these guys. Got him. Boy, it's on now. Look at that, another beauty. Now this is where efficiency comes in. I gotta keep this line in the water. Oh, I spooked him that time. The reason I have to do this funky cast is because it spooks them when I raise anything up into the air or swing the pole. First time I didn't get one to bite it. The worm is bigger now. That's the only thing I can. Oh, I had some moss on it. Well, I wouldn't have thought I'm in a picky mood, but. I'll bring it back. There we go. Oh, man. Cast it over and then bring it in to the nest. Bring it in real suddenly and they'll get a reaction out of there. Got it, got it, got it. Yes! Look at that guy. Got another beauty. Look at that guy. Okay. Oops. Screwed that one up, but doesn't matter. Oh, that's a bruiser. Bruiser! Oh, nice. 
had him wondering if I was a red ear on the nest and there, uh, somebody put a whole bunch of cicada grubs in my nest, what would I do about it? Let's find out. This will be interesting. Red ear, bluegill, any sunfish, cleaning them is all done about the same way. This is the simplest, uh, most common method for cleaning a bluegill. We're just gonna fillet it and we start right under the pectoral fin. We make a single cut and we go down to the spine. Now you wanna have the knife rocked forward like this so that you don't puncture the gut cavity. Okay, that's step one. Next step, Move the fish around, and I like to use the gill plate as a handle. So if you stick your finger in there, you can hold the fish still, and you can use the tip of the knife, and you start right here, and you're gonna trace down the spine just by using the tip of the knife. I'm gonna separate the spine from the meat, cutting through the scales and skin. Now when you get here just past the anus, you're gonna make a plunge cut, and it's important to stay on top of the spine when you make this plunge cut, and now, just pressing the knife against the spine. You're gonna wiggle the knife down to the very end. Don't cut all the way through because leaving a little skin here is gonna be handy for our next step. But now we take the, put your, take your thumb and peel this forward just a little bit. And we're gonna take the knife and push in here and just separate the meat down to the ribs. So the ribs start right about here. So we're separating the meat till we hit the ribs. And then, and listen, hear that? Real gently rub across it. You can tell when you hit the ribs. You don't want to go through the ribs. Now, <laughs> this next step 
the, and this is just the way I found this the easiest, to just grab the skin and peel it back. That's the fastest way. And now the final step is just to fillet the meat off of the skin. And by leaving that little piece of skin attached, you usually have a handle, which I just cut through, but that's it. That's the perfect little fillet of bluegill. Yes.